Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of The Voice of Neuro. We are back for the second ever math lecture available on YouTube and in podcast form with none other than Brett the Legend. What is up, Brett? Hello, Neuro. Thanks for the introduction. You're welcome. It's good to have you. I'm uh, thinking that this time you're going to give us a little bit of wisdom about logic. Is that true? Yeah. So we were talking last time about how the point of this is to, one of the benefits of this is to help people think carefully if they're doing philosophy, if they're thinking about current events, or if they're applying it to technical things or even to the games they play. So logic is a good place to start with no prerequisites to help people think more carefully and rigorously about ideas. Yeah, we talked in the first discussion about the practicality of math and how that's one of the main shortcomings and pitfalls of a lot of math education that people receive is they don't really get shown why it's cool and where you can apply it in daily life. They think, oh, well, this particular formula is never going to come up in my line of work, therefore I'm just going to half-ass this class as much as I can, rather than thinking about how the structures of mathematics apply to even things such as basic conversation that you have with your friends. Yeah, and speaking of the uh, conversation, some of the topics of the logical statements we'll be using for this lecture will come from the games you play. So there'll be some StarCraft II sentences and examples, maybe some World of Warcraft examples with your favorite character, Brunt, the Torin strong warrior. So he'll come up. So we'll try to integrate some of the games you play into the into the top, into the math we do. Um, also, and this is not the main reason for this, but if someone happens to be interested in doing some kind of programming or they do programming in their work or they're studying some kind of programming in school, logic certainly plays a role there and can help them directly. Sweet. So what you're saying is with the power of mathematics, people can power themselves up IRL and get stronger and smarter. There's a possibility, yeah. <laughs> it may or may not happen. Find out on this episode of the Math Podcast. One other disclaimer, um, just a heads up, is that uh, the way I teach, and I've done this for throughout my life when I've taught university and, and elsewhere, is that uh, I try to make the lectures very interactive. And the way this will work for this type of podcast YouTube setting is there will be a lot of examples that are posed as questions that will give a moment to think about. And then we'll talk about the answer. And if chat, the live chat wants to chime in, um, please do so. We love to hear your responses to these questions. And um, if at home, if you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast, pausing during those times, if you want to take a little more time to think about them, is fine too, or not. Totally up to you. But there will be moments like that where we'll be looking at questions and then thinking about the answer and trying to discuss why the answer is what it is. Fantastic. Strap yourselves in. We're about to get going. Section one, introduction. Wow. All right. So I'll try to keep in sync with you. All right. So um, without further ado, here is the introduction. So we're going to start off. You had those bullets. That was good. Um, that is the introduction. Um, so the logic we're going to talk about is divided up into a few parts. Um, basically, let's first talk about what is called fancy names. You'll see that they're actually not so fancy when we get to them. It's propositional logic, which is basic statements, um, things that are true or false, and then how to put statements together like this and that, or this or that. So we'll be talking about these simple things. Um, once we're done with the propositional logic, we'll start talking about first order logic, which lets us say things like something is true for all things, or there is a thing. So that'll really help us make more statements and more interesting statements, I think. Uh, then we're going to have uh, some practice to see if we've understood the first order logic using chessboards. And if we have time, we'll even think, start thinking about some examples of infinite things. And talking about infinity and the various dilemmas surrounding infinity might be an interesting topic for future podcasts. And we're always looking for suggestions for future podcasts. So please let us know. Have at me. 
First Order of Logic, not going to lie, first thing I thought was Star Wars. Is this like Empire Sith First Order and what their take is on Logic? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, oh, it is? Nice. No, no, it's not. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, no, first, yeah, well, well, well I don't want to spoil it. We'll get, we'll get to First Order of Logic soon. As you see, it's the second topic. It'll be, it'll be okay. here before you know it. We're going to do them in order then, propositional logic. Okay, yeah, and then we're all Jedis here. No Sith stuff. So. Okay. All right. See, we're already at section two. This is this is moving too fast. All right. So, so the first thing we're going to talk about is a statement, and a statement is simply a sentence that set, asserts something that is true or false. So, an example of a statement would be Brunt is a Torin. Brunt being the character that Nero plays in World of Warcraft, and Torin being the what, what is the right way to describe what a tauren is? Is that a uh, race or species? I'm not even sure. Yeah, you would say race or species. Both would be correct. All right. Then we also have a lurker is a zerg unit. So a lurker is an example of a unit from the zerg race in StarCraft, another game Neural plays frequently on stream, as I'm sure all of your viewers know about. Some math examples. We have the statement 2 plus 2 equals 5. That is a false statement. The quick maths you were describing earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have the statement three is greater than two, a true statement. So these are the, and what makes these statements is that they are true or false. You could, it's possible that in different universes, they might have different meanings, but they're always going to be true or false. And that's what makes them a statement. And, uh, we will also throughout have a symbolic language for describing these statements and more complex expressions. And whenever we talk about a statement, one of these things that can be true or false, we'll use a capital letter like P or Q. So statements are like the, the, the atoms, the base parts that we're going to use to build up the rest of our logic. So we'll start with these things that can be true or false, and then we'll make more complex things out of it. So let's get more complex. So on the next slide, we show how to take simple statements and make them into more complex statements called compound statements. And the way you do this is by combining simple statements with these operators. So this is going to be very familiar to everyone that uses them in their daily language, the word and. So one thing is true and another thing is true, or or, not, or negation, to negate something, to say something is false. And then something like if then, if this is true, then that is true, also called implying or implication. And so we're going to go through each of these four things separately. And each of these four things has a little symbol associated with it that we'll use in our symbolic logic. So for and, we use this upside down V symbol. And for or, we use a V symbol. For not, we use this like hook symbol. It's an and then, wrench. ah, yes. So if, yes, I guess Allen wrenches are for negating things. Hmm. And then uh, the, uh, right arrow for implying. And sometimes people don't use a double right arrow for this implication, but I like the double right arrow. It's kind of cool looking. So we have the double right arrow. Nice. So we should start to... Hmm? Nice. Great. So on the next slide, we should be talking about and. Start simple. So we'll let P represent the statement that Brunt is a Torin, a true statement for those not familiar, but I'm sure almost everyone here is familiar with your wow escapades. And then Q will be the statement Brunt is strong, also true. Don't want to disparage Brunt. And we'll let R represent the statement 2 plus 2 equals 5. That one's false. Uh, I did that just now. Um, so an example would be to say Brunt is a Torin and Brunt is strong. And that statement is true because both parts of it are true and we connected them with an and. And we write this by saying P and then that upside down V symbol and then Q. So another statement, another example of this compound statement, we can take the statement 2 plus 2 equals 5, and then combine that using and with Brunt as a Torin to get another statement, 2 plus 2 equals 5 and Brunt as a Torin, and that is false because one of the parts is false. So more generally, for a compound statement that uses and to be true, both parts have to be true, and otherwise it is false. And that really uh, lines up with the meaning of and. So far, I think things are doing pretty well. It's a word that we use commonly, and this is a way of making that nice and formal and clear for us. Yeah. And so 
chat can thank us for learning about and <laughs> i didn't know what and was but then i watched a math lecture on neuro's twitch channel and now i know yeah i learned this word and and i use it all the time <laughs> it's so useful this, this is the most useful lecture ever it is a great word of power so now i'm going to use or we're just going to cover all the words you're going to be so <laughs> so full of words I'm gonna be a um, yeah so so we can do a similar statements that we had before like brunt is a torrent or brunt is strong and both parts are true so the or is true and we, we use this v looking symbol for or so if p is brunt is a torrent and q represents brunt is strong then brunt is a torrent or brunt is strong can be represented symbolically as p v symbol q similarly we can have two plus two equals five or brunt is a torrent which is still true because it's or and we don't need both parts to be true the one thing that makes mathematical logic sometimes a little different than English statements, where if someone's trying to speak logically, is that when we say or in math, we always mean either or both. So at least one of them is true. It doesn't mean that one has to be true and not the other. So or, as they say, is always inclusive in mathematics. Yeah, I think That's in language, it's oftentimes expecting the listener to choose one of them and that both is not an option. That ends but. up being a really interesting conversational tactic is the way that you frame questions. Because you can frame a question in a way that leads someone in a certain direction or uh, puts them into a trap or something like that, where oftentimes when people give you an either or question, both may be the best answer. Yeah, you just used the word or, so I was like, should I be on my guard? <laughs> um, the, yeah, yeah, and I think some of the um, ambiguities of the English language definitely help people to frame things the way they want. It's mm -hmm. definitely a tool. So we've done or, and and or. We are so helpful. Everyone, you now know how to say and and or. Um, so the next one we have is not the Allen wrench symbol, as you put. Um, so we can say something like the first statement. So if P is Brunt is a Toron, if we put the Allen wrench symbol, this hook symbol in front of it, we get Brunt is not a Toron, which isn't true. And I don't want to make Brunt feel bad. Just being clear on that. Or a similar way of uh, English statement of saying the exact same thing would be, it is not true that Brunt is a Toron. So we can just this hook symbol and then P. And that's the same exact symbols for Brunt is not a Toron, just Different English corresponds to the same thing. So another way thing we could say, again, sorry to Brunt, this is false, is Brunt is not strong. And we have this not symbol Q, where Q means Brunt is strong. We put the not symbol in front of it and it becomes Brunt is not strong, or it is not true that Brunt is strong, or it is false that Brunt is strong. There's a lot of English that corresponds to the same logical statement. Another example would be if 2 plus 2 equals 5 is r, then not r is 2 plus 2 is not equal to 5. And since 2 plus 2 equals 5 was false, not r, 2 plus 2 is not equal to 5, is true. I think I did that math correctly, so that's good. Makes sense um, to me. All right, we got not. So the theory we've got are pretty straightforward. So just as everyone's getting really comfortable, let's do the one that's less comfy. <laughs> now we will descend into pure chaos. Yes. If then, also called implication, is probably the most confusing one. And part of it is because the mathematical logic sometimes in a strong way disagrees with what the English meaning is. And we're going to talk about this now. And I think it's going to be a little clearer when we get to first order logic, because a lot of the times when people think of if then, they think of it in kind of a first order sense, even though they don't realize that. But, but let, well, let's, let's just get right into it. So we'll make a statement like, if Brunt is a Toron, then Brunt is strong. So if P represents Brunt is a Toron and Q represents the statement Brunt is strong, then we can write if P, then Q. P, arrow, Q, right arrow. And we can do similar for the other ones here, but let me talk about when is an implication statement true. So the statement, if P then Q, which we write as P right arrow Q, is true when either P, the hypothesis, the thing you say, if P then Q, the P, if P is false, then we consider the entire statement true. 
Another case where we consider it to be true is when Q is true, the conclusion. So if P then Q is true exactly when either the hypothesis is false or the conclusion is true. Another way of saying this is that if P then Q is false exactly when the hypothesis P is true and the conclusion Q is false. So there's a few things about this that throw people for a loop. The first is they don't like the whole business about P being false, making the statement true. The logic behind that is that if the hypothesis, if, if P, then Q, like if Brunt is a Torin, then Brunt is strong. If Brunt is not a Torin, it's kind of like saying the whole statement just is, doesn't have a say on the topic. So we'll just by default call it true. So this condition isn't met. So let's, so that, so then this statement is just not applicable. We'll call it true. And the logic, the reasoning for that, I think will be even clearer when we talk about first order logic. One of the other things, oh, so let's read number two, and then I'll try to talk about one of these other reasons why people find this a little bit confusing. So the second one is if Q then P, where Q is Brunt is strong and P is Brunt is a torn. So we can say if Brunt is strong, then Brunt is a torn. And this is, so both the statements, if Brunt is a torn, then Brunt is strong, the first one, and the second one, if Brunt is strong, then Brunt is a torn, both of those are true. But this, kind of some kind of sometimes rums rubs people the wrong way because they're like okay torrens are strong so being a torrin implying that you're strong that makes a lot of sense to me but going backwards and saying that's true that doesn't make so much sense to me because it's kind of like isn't there supposed to be some kind of causal link here that you're missing so i don't want to say that if brunt is strong then brunt is a torrent but mathematically both of those statements are true because in both cases, P is true and Q is true, so that the statement is true, because the conclusion is true. Hmm. And so there's a little bit of a disparity here between the mathematical definition of what implication means here and the fact that in logic, in English, there's different meanings for when you say if then. And I think some, some of the ways we say if then conditionals will be better modeled by first order logic. But in general, this isn't a perfect mapping onto all the times we say if then in English. So basically what you're saying is the rules of logic are not necessarily the same as the conventions we use for language and expression. Yes, yeah, exactly. The rules, this mathematical rules of logic for if then, um, which, so in this case, this is, I believe I'm getting this terminology right. This is called material implication, where it's just like, you just have a flat out definition. You have a hypothesis, you have a condition, and then you have those rules for determining truth. Is the conclusion true or the hypothesis false? But there's other types of implication, meaning when we say if then in our language, and some of those aren't conveyed by this mathematical symbols. And it's just a different meaning. One thing that jumps out at me as a immediate application for this kind of awareness is having a really strict look at the premise of a statement. A lot of times we'll just passively absorb what someone is pitching to us. And sometimes they'll start from say P, which ends up being really faulty. So they can't mm. really build off anything useful from that statement. But if we don't evaluate the truthiness of the premise of the pitch that's being given to us, sometimes we can end up in a really weird situation where they're kind of leading us along uh, in a way that isn't logically sound. Yeah, sometimes people can have, can use logic to sound like they're saying something very precise and very true. But if you don't meticulously follow the sequence of implications, they can just break one link in the chain and the whole thing is false and they've led you to some place you didn't want to go. Yeah. In fact, there's a whole, uh, Industry is the wrong word, but there's a whole class of examples of these fun examples where people prove things like one is equal to zero by sneaking in a false implication along the way. So mm -hmm. there's all these classic proofs of, oh, one is equal to zero or um, yeah, it's, and, and other similar silly facts. So two plus two is equal to five and I prove it. And then they give you a proof and they just try to sort of like a sleight of hand, cover up the one place where you wouldn't expect the false implication to be. Mm -hmm. So this may be a little unsettling at the moment. Maybe you don't like the fact that it doesn't exactly map up to English. Maybe you don't like the fact that when the hypothesis is false, the whole statement is true. But I hope that a little later, uh, maybe in about 15 minutes, when we come back to the same exact thing in first order logic, it'll, have, it'll resonate a little more.
But for now, we're just going to take this as a definition that if you have if p then q, which we write p right arrow q, then that is false when p is true and q is false, and it's otherwise true. So it's true when either the hypothesis p is false or the conclusion q is true. And that's exactly when it's true. And for now, we'll just take this sort of as a definition. And I claim later, it'll feel better. But, we'll but as we pointed out in the first session, a lot of times the correct answer for math or physics or whatever doesn't necessarily line up immediately with your intuition, and that's okay. No, exactly. Because sometimes so, people, they'll be, listen to a, a sequence and they'll say, all right, like what? That's okay to have that as your immediate reaction. We're just yes. getting started here. Certainly. There's, there's, there's part of it is like... Um, learning curve and discomfort and that's that's natural it actually means you're learning something you're actually being exposed to something you haven't seen before that said logic in some ways is very core to the way we reason so it, it should make some sense and it is a little unsettling that this doesn't jive exactly but i hope to make it jive more in just a few moments mm -hmm. cool. all right so i think we've done our compound statements so we just have two more things we want to talk about in propositional logic and one of them are tautologies things that are always true so it's, it's a warm feeling to think about things that are just true all the time, independent of the meaning. So an example of that would be a statement like P, then the V symbol here means or, just to remind you, not P. So a an expression like P or not P, independent of what P means, if P is true or P is false, independent of that, P or not P should always be true. Because either P is true or, tr or not P is true. And one of them is true. And then the or is like either one being true immediately gives it to you. And it is inclusive, right? So both is also an option. But it would be very hard for P and not P to both be true. But that's so, a superposition of P. <laughs> yes. There are, there, are, there are times when people talk about like these logics where things can be sort of one thing or the other, but we're not going to be doing that. So here, either P is true or not P is true, one. And, uh, and, the, and yeah, so the, so the P or not P is always true. So we call such a statement a tautology independent of whether P is Brunt is a Torin or whether P is two plus two equals five, P or not P is always true. And we call that a tautology. Hmm. In contrast, consider a sim, uh, another expression like P and Q. So remember the upside down V is the and symbol. So P and Q. So if pre P represents Brunt as a Torin and Q represents Brunt as strong, then P and Q is true. Success, that's a true case. P is true and Q is true, so P and Q is true. But if instead we let P represent the logical symbol P represent maybe a statement like Brunt is a torn and Q represent two plus two equals five, then P and Q is false. So there are ways to assign truth values to P and Q that makes P and Q false. So P and Q is not a tautology because there are certain ways of assigning values to P and Q that makes it false. And tautologies are reserved for those expressions that are always true those you know those cornerstones where we can always rely on them hmm. logically impeccable perfect yes so let's go through one example i, I apologize if this frightens people we're not going to spend almost any time on these things but one way to verify whether something is true on the next slide is using a truth table so you might have seen this before maybe it's scary we're going to do like two minutes on truth tables just so we because it's, it's good to see them, and then we're not going to do it anymore. Um, so how do you check if a statement is a tautology? And one of the methodical ways of doing that is to just go through all the cases. So if we have this statement, P or not P, let's say we wanted to check if it's a tautology. So one way to do that is to say, what are all the possible values P can possibly take? Just true or false? If that's the case, so that was the first column of this truth table. The second column says all the values given the value of P that not P can take. So if P can be true or false, then not P is false or true. And in both of those cases, as we put in the third column of this truth table, P or not P is true in both cases. So in all possible truth values for P, the expression P or not P is true. So we could say so, the uppercase is Brunt is strong and the lowercase is two plus two equals five, for an example. Is there a, a... oh yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, the upper row. So if, yeah. if in the first row, we were in the world where Brunt is strong is, 
is the is P. P. Yeah. yeah. And then we would never say that Brunt is not strong. It could be a valid way of assigning to P. So yeah. So another example would be two plus two equals five. And that would be like false. And then yes. But in both cases, P or not P is a true statement. So P or not P is always true. And we've val and we've checked it by checking all the combinations in this table. So it's sort of like visually apparent. And this was what proves that P or not P is a tautology. But often you can get away with not writing out the table just by reasoning it. And I think that's a good skill to just think about why one of these statements is or isn't a tautology to sort of just reason it out. Say, well, but let's think about P or not P. Either P is true, in which case P or not P has to be true because it has a P in it and it has an or. But if P is false, the other case, then not P is true. And this P or not P has a not P in it also. So then in both cases, it's true. So we kind of like reasoned out in our mind that what is going on in the truth table and sometimes thinking it through and just it should in some way getting to the point where it rings true that P or not P is always true. Just sort of from like pure reasoning is, is a good place to be. So you don't always have to rely on the truth table. So the truth table is like a, I don't want to say a crutch, but a, a good way to start off. But sometimes thinking it through is good too. Well, the truth table is a visual aid. You can see it represented in front of you. More sure. Easily, I think. And we have one more truth table in us. So I'm going to talk about one more concept that's going to be useful to us. And that's called, it has a fancy name, tautological equivalence. So you can say that at around the coffee table to sound fancy at a party or something, right? But all it means is that two expressions always have the same truth value. So, so one way to check if two expressions always have the same truth type, truth value is to reason out all the cases, but a visual aid for doing that is a truth table. And I wanted to come up with one more, slightly more complicated truth table just to show what a nastier looking truth table looks like. So let's consider two expressions here. We have the negation of P and Q. And the second statement is not P or not Q. And we're, gonna, we're asking, are these two statements, do they always agree on their truth value? Is it always true that if not P and Q is true, then not P or not Q is true? And in addition, if not P and Q is false, then not P or not Q is also false. So this is actually a law. They talk, this is called De Morgan's law, but we're gonna prove it. We don't need to rely on existing concepts. We're just gonna prove it with this truth table. Yeah. And, and the game here is we're just gonna write out all the combinations. So if we have P can be true or false and Q can be true or false, it turns out there are four combinations for what P and Q can be. They could both be true. They could both be false. P could be true and Q could be false, or maybe P could be false and Q could be true. So we have all four combinations of the truth values. And we put those in the first two columns, all four ways, so that we've exhaustively handled all the cases. And in the second two columns, we've written what not P and not Q are given the first two columns. And now we can build up the more complicated statements. So the first statement we were curious about the value of is not of P and Q. So let's first figure out what P and Q is. So let's recall, so P and Q, and the symbol for and again is the upside down V. That is true when both are true. And that only happens in the first row of this truth table, truth table when P and Q are both true. The other three rows have at least one of them false. So, so as we see, true, false, false, false in that P and Q column. And then the negation of that, we just flip them all. So in the Next to last column, we have false, true, true, true. And I got that just by flipping the column before it because we negated it. And negation just flips true to false and false to true. Lastly, we already have columns for not P and not Q, so we can or them together. So we put a true when at least one of them is true. So the first row, both false is false, and the remaining rows all have at least one true in them. So we get false, true, true, true. And then now that we've made this full table, we can look at the last two columns and we can say they are exactly the same. So not of P and Q and the expression not P or not Q are always the same. They are tautologically equivalent. So we've proved the law of logic that independent of what meanings and sentences you assign to P and Q, those variables, those symbols, these two expressions are always the same. Hmm. So
So it's so, and we can we can also reason it out. So when is the statement P and Q false? So based on the definition, it's exactly false when at least one of them is false. And that's exactly what the statement not P or not Q is saying. So logically, just reasoning it out, speaking, it does make a lot of sense that those two things should be have the same columns. Because logically it seems to jive. Yeah. But the truth table then just like seals the deal. It's like, oh, I, don't, I know your logic is, you're reasoning it out, but let's just go through all the cases. And we did all four cases and they do indeed agree. I think the truth table also is a way of breaking it into smaller pieces where you can uh, basically reconcile each individual one rather than trying to tackle the whole thing all at once. Because I think when you first start with this comparison of not P and Q and not P or not Q, it's not obvious that they're going to be the same, but being able to see all of that in front of you, then double check it is pretty helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. You're always, you could be worried like, oh, maybe I missed the case. Did I actually handle everything? And yeah. Um, so I think, I think it's good to have the truth table to check and, and definitely work through. And I think that's great. And also be able to think about, does it make sense that these two statements, because I think it's also good to sort of try to integrate these concepts, which we proved using truth tables into our logic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all I have for propositional logic. So that was a section done. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. And I've summarized it in the next slide. So we have that statement are sentences that are true or false. And we can represent, oh, so I'll get to that in a second. We can make compound statements from these simple statements by mixing them with things like and, or, not, and if then. We can represent these statements and compound statements using expressions containing logical symbols. So we'll use P and Q to be these symbols that represent statements that can be true or false, these truth variables, if you like. And then we have the symbols, the V symbol for or, the upside down V symbol for and, the hook or Allen wrench for not, and the right arrow for if then or implication, implies. So sometimes you, when you read the right arrow, you can read it as if then, or you could also read it using the word implies. And then we said that certain logical expressions called tautologies are always true, independent of the meanings of that you assign to the variables in them. So for all cases of the truth values of the variables in this expression, it is always true. And we said also tautological equivalences are when we have two expressions that always have the same value. So they are equivalent logically. In all cases, they always have the same truth value. And that concludes propositional logic. So I think this would be a good time for us to stop teaching new things and to review using a few interactive questions that we can do with chat. So if you wanna just, when we ask these questions, you can just scream the answer in chat. Me and Neuro maybe will peek. We'll also go over the answers together. So let's think about this for a moment. So we're gonna let S represent the statement, a siege tank is a Terran unit. This is from StarCraft II. Um, we'll let T represent the statement, a queen is a Zerg unit. So I put a symbol there, S upside down V, and then the hook symbol T or Allen wrench. And so I want to know what does that state, what does that expression mean in terms of the statements? So take one second to think about that, and then maybe we'll go over the answer. So the point of this, and also, as I said, if you're listening and for any of these, they'll get a little harder. If you want to pause and think about them, please, please do so. Um, so let's see. So this is trying to remember what these symbols mean. So in this first case, A, the answer is a siege tank is a Terran unit and a queen is not a Zerg unit. And that should be from the next, if you click ahead, I think that oh, will yeah. reveal the answer. So I think I got it right, good. I know some logic, good to know. <laughs> So the next question, part B, is going to have this hook symbol S, and the V symbol, then a hook symbol T, or Allen wrenches, as you put, um, put, instead of hooks. So what does this mean? So take a moment to take a look at it. Remember your symbols. Can I take a guess? Please. Please, and if you see anything from chat also, you're like the conduit for chat. A siege tank is not a Terran unit or 
A queen is not a zerg unit. I feel like I'm not needed here. <laughs> Super smart, yeah! Nero can just teach it. <laughs> well done, sir. I couldn't have said it better myself. Let's move on to the next one. And I see some answers in chat, and I'm liking it. People are learning. Learning is occurring. And yeah, just there's no need to raise your hand in chat. Just uh, scream the answer. Let's do C. So C is going to be the hook symbol. And then in parentheses, S upside down V T, close parentheses. Hmm. What does this say? Yes, and as is being asked in chat, I'm glad I spotted this. I'm making no claim that these statements are, are true. In fact, the first statement is false because a queen is not a zerg unit and there's an and there. And in part B, both statements were false because a siege tank, saying a siege tank is not a Terran unit and a queen is not a Zerg unit, both of those are false and we ORed them, but that's exactly the case where OR is false because both of them were false. So C, uh, what do you think? Or should we just let them have it? It is not the case that a siege tank is a Terran unit and a queen is a Zerg unit. Wow. Sounds good. I like the way that Pillage framed it. Uh, you just say, a siege tank is a Terran unit, and a queen is a Zerg unit. Not. <laughs> mm, a uh, <laughs> modern way of saying it, yes. Yeah. So let's see if I have it right there. It is. I have it almost exactly the way you said it. So well done. Well done. Maybe we'll do, do I have one more? Are any of oh, these so tautologically he... equivalent? Mm. Are any of these statements tautologically equivalent? Okay, so take a moment. So remember the three statements. We had S and not T. We have not S or not T. And we have not of, in parentheses, S and T. Are any of these statements tautologically equivalent? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, wow. Chat's just jumping on it. They are good. Incredible. So Chad is screaming B and C, and that is indeed the correct answer. So let's think about this for a moment. And this is a, the flip of the one we did the truth table of. What does it mean to say something is, it is what does it mean to say it is not true that S and T is true? So not of S and T. When, when is it true that, so let me say this differently. What does it mean to say it is false that S and T occurs so for that to be false for s and t to be false it is exactly the case that either s has to be false or t has to be false so c and b are saying the same thing the first b is saying s is false or true t is false and c is saying s and t is false and those are exactly the same thing and if we wanted to i don't have it here but if we wanted to we could check that with a truth table this also, hit, a, hmm? this also Sorry. hits with a general awareness that you can have two correct answers for something, or you can say the same thing in two different ways. I think a Absolutely. lot of times there's a desire for it all to boil down to one thing that is on its own, whereas here we see different shapes that are basically equivalent to each other. Absolutely, yes. And A is not the same. So an example would be, so let's suppose that S, let's see, what would be a good way? So if we have S is false and T is false, so they're both false, then the statement B would have true or true, but the statement A would have false and false. I'm sorry, false and true. So those are not the same. So if, so like, so if I say it again, if S and T are both false, then A will be false and B will be true. Mm -hmm. So those are not tautologically equivalent. But B and C are the same. And chat jumped right on that. It was amazing. They got it. They got it. Let's 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 try something else. So propositional let's... logic question number one. 
Hmm. Okay. So here we have not, not a, how would you best describe that expression? Is it tautologically equivalent to not a, is it tautologically equivalent to a, is it a tautology? In other words, always true, or is it always false? Sometimes called a contradiction. You have some rock stars in chat. Yep. Logical geniuses. The chat is going with number two. It is equivalent so, to A because the not not cancels out. Double negation. Yeah. So when someone uses double negative, that's like saying the same as, as, as if you were saying no negatives. So not not A, the same as A. And we could also draw a truth table for this. And you would see that not not A and A are the same thing. Because you'd negate once to get not A and then negate again to get back to A. It is not true that Brunt is not strong. Brunt is Brunt strong. would be happy with that. Yes. Brunt, Brunt, Brunt stands by that statement. I don't not watch Nerdo. <laughs> there you go. Mm. So I think number two. Mm. Not of A or B is best described by which of the following? It is tautologically equivalent to not A or not B. It is tautologically equivalent to not A and not B. It is equi tautologically equivalent to A and B, or it is tautolog tautologically equivalent to A or B. Answers are starting to come in. So let's see. So which of these is equivalent to it is false that A is true or B is true? So it's A or B is false, which is the same thing as saying that. What has to be true for A or B to be false? Wow. Not only do we have some twos, we even have a two with a box around it. Yeah. Impressive. So for A or B to be false, you need not A to be false. I'm sorry, you need A to be false and you need B to be false. So again, the answer is two. Yep, this kind of looks like a similar format to the previous example that was given. Indeed, and these are both instances of what is called, yeah, this is, examples like this are instances of something called De Morgan's Law. So this was, we had a similar example in the earlier statements, and we had something just like it in the truth table. And so what happens when you negate an or or an and, and the or or and flips to the other one. So basically you flip everything. So let's just think about this as like, just like a, as if we were like a robot. So you have this not applied to A or B. You negate everything and you flip the upside down V to a, the V to an upside down V or vice versa. So we take not A, flip the V, not B. So you just flip everything. Mm -hmm. So it's just, we can just, instead of thinking of it logically, we just think of it like a robot, just a symbol manipulator. And if we flip all of the symbols, we get option two, not A and not B, as a result of negating A or B. And it's okay too, to use different strategies for whatever appeals to your intuition the best. Yeah, Cause... I remember when I first learned this stuff, yeah, whatever, whatever worked, worked. Yeah. I've talked with some other friends who took similar courses with me and it's interesting to see how different people's minds work and how they can frame the same problem with an approach that is uh, more in line with their intuition. There are some friends who I would describe as having a very builder oriented mindset where they want to make sure every block they understand why it goes there. Uh, for me, I tend to see a big pattern and I go with my instinct. And if that's right, then I consider my intuition up to snuff. But I don't necessarily mm. look at every single piece. Like for this one, when it popped up, my instinct goes for two. But I didn't necessarily have that full understanding of why. It was just seeing the pattern pop up again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think this is like a real dichotomy of how people, some people think bottom up and want to take all the little pieces and build it into like a building. And the other people are try to appreciate what buildings look like and then try to chop the building up and say, oh, it's built out of blocks mm -hmm. and coming at it from both ways is I think is two very different, but totally acceptable ways. Okay. Let's see if we have another one. Number three. 
Ooh. So we have A and B implies B, or stated differently, if A and B, then B. Which of the following best describes this? Is it tautologically equivalent to A? Tautologically equivalent to B? Is it a tautology that is always true? Or is it always false? Hmm. I think it's easier here to assign each letter to a phrase that we visited before. Oh, please do do so. Let's say A is brunt is a torrent, B is brunt is strong, mm -hmm. and then B brunt is strong. So if brunt is a torrent and brunt is strong, then brunt is strong. So that seems like a tautology to me. Absolutely. Three. So you, you, you established a case where A and B are both true, and it's certainly true. And in general, if A and B are, so, so yes, having A and B should imply B because you have both of them. Mm -hmm. So both should imply just one of them. And similarly, it's also the case that A, a and B implies A is also a tautology. Mm -hmm. So right on the money. Um, if we, we could also have used the truth table or reasoned it out like, okay, if B is true, then the conclusion of this conditional, this implication is true. So then we're immediately good. If A is true, oh, sorry, let me, let me say this differently. Let me not talk about A. So if we, I said, if B is true, then we're done. If B is false, then the hypothesis is false. And then we're again true. So reasoning it out, we could also see that it's always true. The two cases being B is true, the conclusion is true, B is false, and the hypothesis is false. And we're good. Well done, sir. Intuition is good. Yeah. Number four. I think, yeah, we have just have two left, and then we'll move on to first order logic. So let's see what this one is. Ooh, it has more symbols in it. We have brackets okay. now. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, let's think about this. We're getting a little trickier. Hmm, we'll see how chat does. They've been knocking them out of the park so far. So, um, so if A and A implies B, then B. So let me say that one more time. If we have A and we have that A implies B, then B. Which of the following best describes the both the, this expression? It is equivalent to A implies B. It is equivalent to A and B. It is always true, or it is always false. Mm, very active chat. So let's think about this. So brought varied answers. I see also the same people answering different answers. So it's just like hitting all bases. It's good. Um, so the idea here is that if A is true and A implies B is true, right? We would expect that to imply B all the time. So this is exactly the case of where I would say, um, let's say, if it rains, then the lawn is wet. And I also tell you that it rains. Then we would always expect that to then to be able to conclude that the lawn is wet. So we have a premise implying like a condition, a hypothesis implying a conclusion. And I tell you that the hypothesis is true. Then you should be able to conclude the conclusion. But let's think about it a little more methodically by just going through what the values are. So if B is true, we are done because then the conclusion is true. So we only have to handle the case where B is false. Now, if B is false, then we look at A. And if A is false, we are done. And if A is true, then A implies B is false, and again, we're done. So that's a little harder to work out mentally, and maybe a truth table here if you if you want to like 
fully get it all down is like the best methodical way to go. And I invite people to do the truth table and maybe in the future we could do a few more truth tables if we want. But if you do the truth table here, you will see that it is always true. And this is a, and this is what you, you'd, you'd hope this would always be true because this is what you want to be as one of your ways of like deducing something. You want to be able to say that if you have something true and then you know if that's true, then something else is true. You want to be able to say that other thing is true. So if you have a A and then you know that A implies B, then you should, you want to say that B must be true and that is the case. So if you have A and A implies B, then it is true that you have B. Yeah, and some, yeah, this is a deduction rule sometimes. Got a mixture so, of ones and twos in the chat for this one. It's, this one's sneakier. I mean, we had a lot of letters here. Um, so it is, is not the same as saying A implies B. Um, so A implies B is sometimes false. So an example would be, let's see what, how they're different. So A implies B is false when A is true and B is false. So let's see what happens when we plug A true and B false into the statement we have. So let's try to do that. So if we plug A true, we have, the tr we have true for the first day and we have true for that second day. And then we have B false. So A implies B is false when A is true and B is false. So which means this entire and statement is false. Which means this implication is true. So it can't be the same as A implies B because when A is true and B is false, number one is false. But this, the question PL4, the statement in the question is true in that case. In fact, it's always true. And the same case breaks number two and shows that it's not the same as the question. So it is indeed always true. And this was a little tricky. And sometimes it's good to have something that's a little tricky because I know um, you, you want to have something that challenges your thought, makes you have to think a little more deeply. Because sometimes if all the exercises are just obvious, it, you, don't have, you don't have that moment where you have to pause and really like think a little deeper about it. And sometimes it's good to just have one or two that just tricky a little bit. And this one is a little tricky. So we'll have one last one and then we'll move on to another topic. A implies B. Okay, that's less symbols. I'm liking this one already. Less to, less to read. What best describes the above expression? A implies B. It is this equivalent to B. It is equivalent to B implies A. It is equivalent to A and B, or it is equivalent to not B implies not A. Oh, wow, people jumped on this one. Yep. Lots of fours. Oh, my. Okay, so let me first talk about two. So when you have the statement, if A, then B, also or stated equivalently, A implies B, if you flip them around and say B implies A, that is a different statement, and that is called the converse. And that is different. So, so, so as a statement we'll come to later, if you were making a statement like um, all Torans are strong, like if you're a Toran, then you're strong. That should be different than saying, if you're strong, then you're a Toran. Yeah. Because one is saying that Torans are strong and the other is saying everyone who's strong is a Toran. Mm -hmm. So those are different. So the, the first statement and two should be different. Um, that's the, the, unfortunately, the argument I just got, that very intuitive argument, is a first order logic argument that we're going to talk about later. So here, you can just go through some cases and see that they differ. So one case they differ on. So suppose A is true and B is false. Then the implication, A implies B, is false. But B implies A is true. So you already see a place where they differ. So A implies B and B implies A can't be the same because they differ when A is true and B is false. As just example. to tie in here, converse then would be flipping what you're looking at horizontally. Inverse would be flipping it upside down. So the regulars would become knots. Yeah, so to we, I think I haven't specifically talked about negating an implication, but you could do that too. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'll talk about that right afterward because that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, so the correct answer is four. And the way you get that is you 
converse and you negate both parts. And that's what you call the contrapositive. And so four is the same as the statement. Four is the correct answer. So what is the negation? Neuro asks, great question. What is the negation of A implies B? So when is A implies B false? And the negation of A implies B is, so how do we get A implies B to be false? We need A to be true and B to be false. So the negation of A implies B is A and not B. It would have been smart if I put that as one of the options. In hindsight, I'm like, ah, that's a great idea. Um, so the negation of A implies B, which I don't have here as an option, is A and not B, which is A, the, pr the premise, the, the, the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. That's the negation of A implies B. Great question, Nero. Superb. So we did it. We did some warm-ups. We, we learned about prepositional logic. We did some questions. It was, it's great. And now we're, we're into it. Section four, first order logic. And there's a lot of things we can't do with prepositional logic that we're going to be able to do now. And so the lot, when you, a lot of most mathematical statements you make in first order logic, and you'll see why, because there's a few things you want to say that are crucial that you can't say yet. And basically it's going to be variables and quantifiers. So let's get right into it. Let me say it. Predicates, so, definition. So we have predicates. So a predicate is an expression whose truth value is predicated or depends on the value of its placeholder or variable. So let me give you an example of a predicate. Let the, the predicate, which we represent with a symbol S and then in parentheses X, represent the predicate X is strong. So let me give you two examples of how we could use that predicate to make statements. So, so, we, so suppose we plug in for X, X is a placeholder. So we replace X with the name Brunt. So if we just plug Brunt in where X is in the predicate, we get the statement Brunt is strong. Or if instead we plug Sylvanus in where X is, we get Sylvanus is strong. So this predicate S of X, that's how you could read it. The S parenthesis X parenthesis, you could read it like S of X is a statement template. It's like a statement maker. You plug in things for X and then you get statements. It's kind of like a, like a template letter. Like you're, you're writing a letter to all your characters and you just plug in Brunt and you get a Brunt is strong. And then you want to also send a letter to your other character and you put, plug in their name. So it's a template for making statements and you just plug in for the place for the X and you get new statements each time. Now we know what a predicate is. Got predicate. Okay, so here's another example. A predicate that uses two arguments just to show you can do that and they can have more. So this is an example from Lord of the Rings. So let T X Y represent the predicate that X is taller than Y. So if we have T of Gandalf comma Frodo, that will represent Gandalf is taller than Frodo. And if we have T of Gimli, comma Legolas, that would represent the statement Gimli is taller than Legolas. And the first is Gandalf is taller than Frodo is true, and Gimli is taller than Legolas is false. So another example of using a predicate, and then you get these variables X and Y, and then you can plug in for them. And one of the great things you can do with predicates comes next, quantifiers. So this allows us to say things like something holds true for everything or holds true for something. So the two quantifiers are for all, and the symbol you use for for all is the upside down A, A like all. So you just make the A upside down and you get for all, that's the symbol. And then for the quantifier there exists, Use an E, but a backwards E, a backwards capital E. So a back, so an upside down capital A for for all and a backwards capital E for there exists. And then to use a quantifier, you have to agree on what the universe is you're talking about. So when you say for all, you wanna make sure you confine yourself to some domain of interest. So maybe it'll be all StarCraft II units or all 
World of Warcraft characters or all characters in the Lord of the Rings universe, or maybe all numbers or all sets if, when we later talk about- For all Twitch streamers, there exists a terms of service agreement they must abide. Indeed, very relevant to Twitch streamers. Yeah. <laughs> so here's an example um, where we'll talk about StarCraft II units. So we'll let S of X be the predicate that X is strong. And we'll let the universe be all StarCraft II units. So if we use the upside down A, X, to mean for all X, so if we have for all X, S of X, that means, and there's a few ways, there's a lot of equivalent English ways you could say this, but a few ways would be for all StarCraft II units, which I call X, X is strong, but maybe a more common way of saying this would just be to say that all StarCraft II units are strong. So that's what this for all X, S of X means, given that the universe is all StarCraft II units and S of X means is strong, X is strong. So we can use this sequence of symbols to say all StarCraft II units are strong. If instead we use the backward Z symbol, we get there is at least one strong StarCraft II unit. Or another way of saying it is there exists a strong StarCraft II unit, or there exists a StarCraft II unit, which we'll call X, such that X is strong. Lots of different ways of saying there is at least one. So exists means another way of saying there is at least one. So we have two quantifiers. We can say everything for all, and we can say there exists. And now we've got, we've got, that's got first order logic. Maybe we thought it was going to be terrible, but that was it. So let's, uh, let's go through another example to test out our understanding of first order logic. And this one will be a more mathematical example. So we're going to let the universe be all the whole numbers, also called integers. So this is like the positive number, whole numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the negative ones, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, et cetera, zero. So all the whole numbers, no fractions here. Now I want to consider the following statement. For all x, the following, and the following is x is greater than zero implies two x is greater than zero. And you can think of this as being like for all x and then an expression v of x, and v of x is that expression x is greater than zero implies two x is greater than zero. So this is for all x v of x, where v of x is x greater than zero implies two x greater than zero. And what is the meaning of this statement? If we kind of like set it out in English instead of me reading out the symbols, it means for all whole numbers x, if x is greater than zero, then two x is greater than zero. Or maybe a little easier to say would be if you double a positive whole number, it remains positive. Now first, let's think, does this statement feel true? If we take a positive whole number, like one, two, three, four, five, and we double it, add it to itself, do we still get a positive number? That, that seems true. That is a true statement. But here's a question. Does negative x equals negative one pose a problem? Because negative one is an integer. It's a whole number. It's a negative whole number. Because negative one, when you double it, it's negative two, which is not positive. Does that mean that this statement, our statement, our for all statement is false? No, because as one. we learned earlier, if the condition statement that you start with is false, then you're done and it's correct. You don't have to worry about the conclusion. Exactly right. And that's now it makes a lot of sense why we would want that to be true. Why that we want, if the condition fails to hold, that we don't hold it against the statement. The statement should only be measured where the condition holds. So we want to say that this statement, x, x greater than zero, this, this predicate, x greater than zero and plus two x greater than zero, is always true for all x. Because even if you if you even though the conclusion has issues when x is negative one, the condition didn't hold. So it's like, why are you holding me against something I, I didn't even assume? Look, 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 it's not the printer's fault. You can't put waffles into the paper slot. It's not meant to take that. You should, I mean, this is this is general advice. I mean, there's, there's so many <laughs> life lessons being learned on this stream. All the printers saved. Yeah. Now everyone's just wondering what's going to happen if you put a waffle into a printer. <laughs> yeah, and they're going to start putting honey and syrup in for their don't ink do or toner. Yeah, don't do any of these things. 
Don't mix printers the, and breakfast. The printer is fine. You're using it wrong. So let's do another example from World of Warcraft. So we'll let S of X denote the predicate that X is strong. And we'll let T of X denote the predicate X is a tauren. And so now we'll do statement number one. For all X, T of X implies S of X, which means not in symbols, but in English, if we associate those meanings of the predicates, we have, if a wow character X is a tauren, then X is strong. Or in other words, in WoW, all Torrens are strong. So both of those are legal ways of reading those symbols. So Torrens are strong. So you're saying for all units, if they are a Torrens, so, restrict, so we restrict to the case, that's our assumption, that for all units, we're making a statement only about Torrens, because that's our hypothesis. And we're saying, if you're a Torren, then you're strong. So we're basically saying that all Torrens are strong. Now let's look at statement two. For all s, s of x implies t of x. Or in other words, in wow, all characters, all strong characters are torrents. Or in other words, if you are strong, then you are torrent. Do these two statements have the same meaning? No. Unless strength in and of itself is inherently a torrent fighting spirit capacity, which is kind of getting into some weeds. <laughs> Right. So if we believe that, for example, Sylvanas is a strong character and Sylvanas is not Torin, then we're in trouble with this statement. Yeah. Brunt may think this. I don't know. Oh, we could ask him. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about implications and then we'll be basically done with, except for one more thing to say about, uh, about first order logic. We're going to talk about negation after this, but a little bit more in implications. So, so, so let's again have S of X be X is strong and T of X be X is a Torin. And we'll again consider this statement for all X, T of X implies S of X. Or, so we have different English sentences that correspond to this. And I just want to get people comfortable with the different English sentences because these come up sometimes in English, but definitely in math a lot. So you can say in wow, if a character is Torin, then they are strong. That's the one we had, one of the English sentences we corresponded with before. Another way of saying this, so let's think about this. It is necessary to be strong to be a Torin. That is equivalent to the expression I have above there. It's another English meaning. So, th and this is, this is true. If we believe that all Torins are strong, the saying it is necessary to be strong to be a Torin is a true statement. Let's think about that. Let's think this through. If you are not strong, you're definitely not a Torin if you believe that all Torins are strong. So a necessary condition to be Torin is to be strong. Well, you're huge. So if you're not strong, you can't move and then you die. Yeah, it's, that's bad. It is actually <laughs> vital to move yourself to get bread from the baker <laughs> or Indeed. go for a hunt. These are bits of knowledge from an experienced WoW player. Brunt, half a ton mist runner. So another way of saying the exact same thing is to say that in World of Warcraft, it is sufficient to be a Torin to be strong. So it is a sufficient condition to being strong is to being a Torin. So if you know someone's a Torin, then you know they're strong. It's sufficient to know someone is strong. If you want to, if you want a sufficient condition to tell you whether or not someone is strong, it's sufficient to know they're a Torin. Because if you know they're a Torin, then they're strong. All I need to know about this bodyguard mission is the person applying. If they're Torin, they're fine. <laughs> they're going to be strong enough. So someone's asking in chat. So the sentence "all Torins are strong" does not ban the possibility that elves are strong. Correct. If and if, there's, and if I said instead only Torrens are strong, then nobody else can be. Yes. So you definitely, with that statement, nailed that whole T implies X versus S implies T we had before. That's, that's correct. Good comment from chat. Um, good way to rephrase it. Um, so yeah, so we have that. So all these four statements are saying the same exact thing as the implication, that it's necessary to be strong to be a Torrent, that it's sufficient to be a Torrent to be a strong. Or in other words, um, the fourth one is, 
in WoW, a character being a Tauren implies they are strong. So this is another way of saying if then using the implies word. So these are all equivalent ways of saying the same thing using different English letters, is sends. All right, the last thing we have about quantifiers, negating. So let's think about this. So we'll let S of X represent X is strong. And we'll think about some universe, like let's say StarCraft II. So what does the statement not, and then we have the upside down A and then X and then S of X, what is that statement? So if chat wants to answer, anyone wants to answer, go for it. Here's, here's a chance for you to try to understand what the symbols were saying, try to remember, also integrate this negation. All StarCraft units are bad. <laughs> so let's see. So this is so it's saying um, we could say it is not true. It is not true that all StarCraft units are strong well the not being next to the all is kind of tricky so, so let's so let's, so the, maybe maybe it would have been clear if i had parentheses I'm, i intend the not to apply to the whole statement hmm. so you so you have so you imagine the statement being for all x s of x is the whole statement and then i just put a not on that statement it is not so, the case that all starcraft units are strong there you go. Which That's doesn't exactly... necessarily mean they're all bad. It just means that there's at least one bad unit in there. Ooh, you are, you are jumping ahead, <laughs> sir. You are a slick logician. <laughs> let's, let's see. So, that, so we have this. It is not true that every SE2 unit is strong. And I think that's exactly yeah, there what you're saying. There are ultras. I'm just <laughs> weaving Zerg in joke. some balance wine here. Let's go. Zerg jokes, yes. <laughs> Okay, I, I shouldn't say this because now the stream's gonna hate me, but I'm a Terran. <laughs> I apologize. It's okay. We probably have Terran viewers here. You're welcome. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so what about this one? Number two, we have the negation symbol, then the backward Z, X, and then S of X. What are we thinking? Mm, someone in chat said, at least you're not Protos. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Sorry. No. All due respect to Protos. Yes. They, they, should, they, they deserve it. They're... I'm trying to say that with a straight face. <laughs> so let's see. The not symbol, the backward Z, X, S of X. What does this say? It is so not the case that there exists a strong StarCraft unit. Correct. Or in other words, there does not exist a strong unit. Which you could also say all StarCraft units are bad. Whoa. Whoa. Yes. We're getting there. Let's do number three. We're going to have all the combinations. Number three. We have the upside down A, X, the negation symbol, S of X. So now the negation symbol is only applying to S of X and it's inside of the for all. So this is the for all X negation symbol S of X. What is that? So this one's going to be for all StarCraft units. They're not strong. So, so for, you can say for all StarCraft units X, X is not strong. You can say every StarCraft unit is not strong. Just like blanket everywhere. And now we have the final one, number four. The backward Z, X, the negation symbol, S of X. And this one is, there is a StarCraft II unit that is not strong. And you, earlier you said the ultra. There exists at least one bad unit. At least one bad unit. Okay. So now... The final question for this page, are any of the previous equivalent, meaning for any universe, 
StarCraft II, WoW, whatever, and for any meaning of the predicate S, are there any statements here that are always the same meaning? And you basically spoiled this with your brilliant comments. Oh, man. We should have practiced. Darth Vader is Luke's dad. Well, I wasn't metagaming. I didn't read ahead this uh, slide. Well, yeah, you just intuited it. Yeah. Well done. Good job. No, I'm not upset at all. You, you, you really, uh, it, it, you, you foreshadowed. It was really good. And people are answering. They are. I think it seems like people are agreeing with your foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. They're trusting you. So they're saying one and four and two and three. So let's see. So no, it is not true that every StarCraft two unit is strong. So how is that the case? How is it the case that it is not true that every StarCraft two unit is strong? then there must be one that isn't strong. So one and four should be the same. Mm -hmm. And then for two and three, saying that all StarCraft two units are not strong, they're all weak, is the same thing as saying there does not exist a single strong one. So one and four and two and three are the same. And hopefully I have that written. And I do. Yep. Go slides. All right. All right. So now we can summarize. We've, we've learned first order logic. We are, we are so good now. So we have predicates, such as x is strong, or like statement templates, where x is a variable or placeholder. And we have quantifiers, where we can say for all, which we use an upside down a as a symbol. And there exists, where we use a backwards e. And then we have the meanings of for all. Once so we have for all x, v of x, where I use this calligraphic v here, looks fancy, to mean that the expression V of X holds for all choices of X in the universe that you've pre-selected. So maybe it's the StarCraft II universe or the WoW universe. And then you have the backwards E X exists X. There is at least one X such that V of X means that this expression V of X, when you plug in for X has to hold for at least one thing in your universe, like at least one StarCraft II unit or at least one WoW character. And we learned that negation, if we just want to be symbolic robots, swaps quantifiers. So you take the negation to the for all, it becomes an exists. And it just moves right in. So when you take the negation, you just move it right over the for all, it just becomes an exists and goes inside. And you take the negation and you move it over the exists, it just becomes a for all. So saying it is not true that something holds for everything turns into existence of something. So this comes up in math a bunch. When you're trying to disprove something is true for everyone, or for all numbers or for all things, you just have to establish one counterexample. You just have to prove that there exists when you're trying to negate a for all. So someone says, no, 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 no. All units are strong. You just have to establish one unit isn't strong on ultra. Name me one bad unit. <laughs> Done. They're all strong. Name me one bad one. You cannot disprove the fact that they're all strong units. And you say, ah, have you looked at the ultra lately? Got them. Not doing too good. <laughs> And if you want to prove that something is not, that there does not exist something where it's true, then you have to prove all of them are false. A little bit of a harder thing to do than to establish one counterexample. All right, so I think we're ready for some questions on first order logic. And then I have some review puzzles. So we'll see, okay. So let's let P of X represent the statement X is a protos unit. The protos come into play now. And we'll let R represent the statement that X, sorry, that R of X. So P of X is X is a protos unit and R of X represents X can repair buildings. And let the universe be StarCraft two units. Which statements do the following expressions represent? So, so I have this upside down A, X, P of X. So we'll do this one quickly. What is that saying? That says all StarCraft II units are protos. Not true, but that's what it says. All right, let's do B. Got a little trickier. The upside down A of X and P of X implies not R of X. So what does this say? Of all StarCraft units, if it's a Protoss unit, then it cannot repair shit. Absolutely correct. Well done. 
it says protos units cannot repair buildings they just destroy them with their silly air units c the upside down a of x and then the statement we're taking the for all of is not r of x implies p of x what does this say hmm For all StarCraft units, if it can't repair stuff, then it's a Protoss unit. Is this one true? No, not necessarily. Could be a Zerg unit. Sure. Zerg units are not too good at repairing. They just seem to destroy my barracks. <laughs> good at destroying buildings. So that one's not true either. Let's see, D. So we have exist x, p of x, and not r of x. So this says that there is a protos unit that cannot repair buildings, right? There, or there is a unit that is protos and it does not repair buildings. Colossus. And that, yeah, Colossus does not repair units. Buildings or units. It, it yeah, it, it shreds infantry is what it does. It reverse so, repairs the enemy base. Yeah, it, it makes you cry. It's a crying machine. Oh no. Um okay, now let's look at this one. This is an interesting one. It kind of flips makes us think a little. So we have for all of X, P of X in parentheses, implies for all of Y R of I. What does this say? This is a little a little bit trickier, but I think we can get it. What does this say? Any ideas from chat? It's like, where did this Y come from? <laughs> mm. Cobra thinks I'm biased. You're noticing my Terran coming out. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so what this says is, oh, Oh, perfect. A great answer from chat. If every StarCraft II unit is Protoss, then every StarCraft II unit can repair buildings. Exactly. And this statement, this statement is true, weirdly. Why? Because the premise is false. Exactly. Every unit is not Protoss. Well done. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Last one. The negation of there exists X such that P of X and R of X. And that will be there does not exist a, Protoss, a unit that is Protoss and repairs buildings. There is, or there is no Protoss unit that can repair buildings. True. And that's true. All right. Let's, we only, I think we only have three of them. So we'll do some three first order logic questions and then we'll move on to chess boards. And I think we'll be, that'll be it. So let's talk about these first order logic questions. So number one, so we have the statement for all X, P of X, which of the following best describes this? Is it equivalent to there exists X not P of X for all X not P of X? It is not true that there exists X not P of X, and it is not true that for all X not P of X. Which of these is the same as for all X P of X? A, B, C, or D? And it should be true independent of the universe and what P means. I wasn't having a weird day, but then I had to think independent of the universe and I've been confused ever <laughs> since. <laughs> Things got weird. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like Chad is in consensus. Yeah. But you said you said later you'll be doing a StarCraft two stream with someone and you'll be a, <laughs> like, wait a second, let me think about this strategy independent of the universe. <laughs> let me just step outside the universe for one minute. Chad has a consensus of C. So if we just act like a symbolic robot and we look at C and we take the knot and we move it across the exists, it becomes a for all and then the double knot turns into P. 
So that is exactly correct. If we want to think about this logically, we can say, what it, so maybe we think about it as like for all x, p of x. That's the same thing as saying there does not exist an x where p of x is false. So well done, chat. There was even a big capital C. It's vehemently C from chat. I'm liking it. Number two. Which of the following implies that there is exists an x such that q of x for any choice of universe and meaning of p of x and q of x? So the first choice is um, for all x, q of x implies p of x. The second is for all of x, p of x or q of x. The third is for all x, p of x or for all y, q of y. And the last choice D is there is a y, p of y and for all x, p of x implies q of x. Which of these four choices implies there is an x such that q of x? That's <laughs> nasty. Nasty. What did you do with that? We only have one, one left, so I, I wanted to make it a little... Oh, wow. Someone jumps out with two Ds. Correct, chat. Well done. So let's just read D and try to parse it. So the first part says, there is a Y such that P of Y is true. So we have some, there is going to be some Y. There is, maybe there is some, there is some Torin unit. If P is Torin, then Q is strong. And there is some Torin unit. And the second part of D says, it's also true that if you have any P, any X that satisfies P, it has to satisfy Q also. So there, if you have any, any unit that is Torin, then it's also strong. So the first part would be saying if P means Torin and Q means strong, that there is a Torin. And the second part would mean all Torins are strong. This guarantees that there must be a strong unit. So maybe you, there exists a Torin, maybe that's Brunt. And then the second part says, well, all Torins are strong. So that must mean that Brunt is strong. So D having there be something that satisfies P and then saying that all P's are Q's gives you that there must be a Q. And the others don't provide this. So well done chat. We've showed how to start with there being something and then using the implication to get something else. This is logical implication. So our final first order logic question. Oh no, I think I just ended there. Great. We're going to have we're gonna, now we're going to practice logic using some visual cues. So I think whenever you can introduce some visual aids to help, to help review logic and to help understand, that's good. So we're going to take a standard chessboard, eight by eight chessboard. It's going to have eight rows and eight columns. And each of them, I'm just going to number them one through eight, rows one through eight and columns one through eight. I'm not going to use any chess lingo, just both numbered one through eight. And then on the next slide, I'm going to define a predicate. So what PIJ means is that there's a piece in row I, column J. So what I want to do now is just give the logical expression for the statement, there is a piece in row two. How would you write that using the predicate? And maybe other stuff. How do we use the logic, the first order logic we've learned to say there is a piece in row two. Oh man, we've even got the backwards capital E in the chat. In the chat, that's impressive. Mm. I've, I've even I've thought about like, mm, maybe there should be some math emotes. <laughs> someone can math on somebody with a crazy emote. So, oh, and someone's echoing. So, so in chat, the answer is there is an X such that P two com X. So let's see. The answer is, I think I use J here. So I have the solution being there exists a J such that P two comma J. So what is that saying? So remember, PIJ means there's a piece in row I column J. So, so we're saying there exists a column such that there's a piece, there exists a column J such that there's a piece in row two column J. That's saying there is a piece in row two. So we've used, 
this, our first sort of logic to describe something about this board. Very good. Another thing we could have done, which maybe, I don't, the answer is not cheating, but it was a little less compact, is to just write out eight statements. We could, said, we could have said P21 or P22 or P23 or eight times. And that wouldn't be the most elegant way of writing it, but that would have been true also. And someone's asking in chat, is there a symbol for such that? So when you say, so in the English, when you translate the symbols, um, when, you, when you write exists with the backwards E, J, and then a statement, you naturally add the word such that in between. Um, there are sometimes symbols people use for like conclusions. And sometimes when, uh, we, we're not talking about this today, but if you're using like set notation, sometimes you can think of the bar and the set as being such that. But but you get a such that for free when you use exists, when you translate it into English. There exists a J such that P2J. Let's try another one. See how chat does on this one. Number two, how would you come up with a logical expression for column three has no empty squares? We're going to get an upside down A. People are trying to figure out how to type that. <laughs> I think people can copy off of the comment. Someone just wrote all of the symbols ever. So, so someone's saying for all X, P, X, three. So that's very good. That's one way of writing. Can we think of another way of writing it? So, so that one says every, for all rows, there is a piece in, in row X, column three. Very nice. So another way we could say it is using negation that uh, there doesn't exist a, a position where there's no piece in it. So there does not exist an I such that not PI3, which means there does not exist a row where there's no piece in row I, column three, or equivalently, every single square in column three in all rows is, is, has a piece in it. So we say for all rows, for all I, PI three means for all rows, there's a piece in row I, column three. Very nice. Let's try one more. If there is a piece at row two, column three, then row three is empty. So we first need to think about, so this is an if then statement. So we should definitely be thinking about having an implication somewhere in there. So think about that. And then we wanna start with the condition of the implication. So you wanna say, how do we say there is a, there's a piece at row two, column three. And then lastly, we want the, conclu the, the, the conclusion of the if then statement, which is row three is empty. There are no pieces in row three. So let's see. So we can write as the solution P23, meaning there's a piece in row two, column three. And that implies that we could either say for all columns J, there's not a piece in row three, column J. Or if you like, we could have also done this with the exist statement. So that's, and that's the solution. So, and hopefully what I have on the slide agrees with that. I think it does. Very nice. Slides correct so far. Nice to see. So we could have also written this as uh, P23 implies not there exists P3J. Just the equivalent negation form of the conclusion. Very nice. Chat did great. I think I just have two more of these. Um, the diagonal starting in the upper left corner and ending in the lower right corner has at least one piece in it. So let's think about this. Do you think, so firstly, let's think, should you think we're gonna need a for all or an exist for this one? So this is a diagonal and we're saying it has at least one piece. 
So that to me sounds like there's going to be an exists. You and now we need some way of just for all i and j where i is equal to j. Hmm. So and then we're going to want to say something. So yeah, so we could talk about i and j where i is equal to j. That is that is. Yeah. So we 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 could we could integrate something like a for all in there. I think I have this one just using an exists. There, there, there are other ways you could have written it if you wanted to have an I and a J and setting them equal. I think for here, I just use one indication, like one, one variable. And I said, there is an I such that PII. So I kind of, you, a little bit of an economy of, of symbols. But we could have also done something where we had an I and a J and then we forced them to be equal. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting aspect of finding an answer because you have different arguments. One would be what is the answer you can write out that takes the least amount of time, that's the mm. fastest and the most compact, or you could have an answer that maybe allows you to understand the problem more effectively. And you could sure. play with multiple of them too. Say you get a problem on your homework, sometimes you could take one route and see what that feels like and then you could take another route. I know I did that quite a bit in my analysis course that I took. Yeah, so for this one, we could say there is an i and there is a j, such that i is the same as j and pij. And that would be on this equals type thing, which is, which is, which is good. Mm. Yeah, so there, that would be another way of writing, and that would be a very nice way, too. So I like it. Oh, OK. So now we're going to switch gears a little. OK. So now I'm going to give you the statement. And what I want chat to think of is what a board would look like that would satisfy the statement. and Try to make the number of pieces minimal. So, and tell me how many pieces are on that board. So, think of a board that satisfies this statement, and then try to make it have the minimum number of pieces. And tell me how many pieces are on your board. So, here's the question. Here's the statement. There is a J such that for all i, p i j. And recall again that p i j means there's a piece at row i column j, and the universe is all numbers from one to eight. So, let's try to first think before we answer the question, what does this mean in English? So exist J for all I P I J. I would say for all rows, there exists a piece in each column. Okay. Now you just, I'm, you are so good at this. So what you highlighted was we have to be careful. There's a difference between having the exist before the for all and the for all before the exist. Mm -hmm. And that was exact, you, you nailed it on the head. So, so we, now we have to be clear on this. Do we mean, so are we saying there is, a, there is a column such that for all rows, or are we saying for all rows there is a column? And those, as, as you'll see, have different meanings. So the order of exist and for all is crucial. Mm -hmm. so, so this one, I think the order I have here, it seems to say there is a column such that for all rows, pij. And if we flipped it around and it was for all i exist j, that would mean for all rows, there is a column. Mm. So, I, you, so I don't remember, but you may have stole my second question. <laughs> you have this uncanny way of exactly figuring out the next thing I want to ask. OK, so we get the solution for this one. Eight pieces. So there is a column such that for all rows, there's a piece in that. And if you want to have the, a minimal possible answer, you choose one, of, choose one column and fill it up, and you get eight. There's a full column. Very nice. Let's do number two. You see, you. you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, but it, it's amazing. You do, you, you're so good at this. Yeah. Very nice. Um, so now we have, for all i, there exists j, not pij. So here, pij, again, represents there is a piece in row i column j, and the universe is 1 through 8. So to repeat, for all i, there exists j, not pij. Think of a board with a minimum num number of pieces that satisfies this, and how many pieces are on your board. Before we do that, let's think about what this means in English. This is saying, let's see, so the for all comes first. So it's saying for every row, 
there is a column with no piece in it. So what's the least number of pieces we could get away with to make this true? So there's lots of boards that satisfy this. Well, what if, if it was an empty board? An empty board satisfies it, right? An empty board definitely has in all rows at least one column with no, with no piece. Mm -hmm. Empty is, is very simple. Now, there's lots of other boards that satisfy this that aren't empty. But if we wanted the minimal possible example, zero pieces. Because empty boards definitely satisfy this statement. All right, let's But there's such a the strong next. cognitive bias to want to put a piece on the board. Pieces <laughs> on boards are nice. Yeah, well, what is this board doing? Ah. It's like the board yearns for some kind of piece, some use. Okay, let's see. Now this one, same setup. There is an I and there is a J such that I is not the same as J. I is not equal to J and PIJ and PJI. So again, PIJ represents there's a piece in row I, column J. PJI then would mean there is a piece in row J, column I. And PIJ is row I, column J. And then, so again, one more time, the statement is there is an I and there is a J such that I is not equal to J and PIJ and PJI. I want a board with the minimum number of possible pieces and think about what that board looks like. So what are we thinking? Chat just screaming this one. So they're saying, what if we had uh, two pieces? Mm. Yeah, so that, that sounds like it will be true. So let's think of the English statement first. This is saying, there is a nine and is a J that are different. So we have two numbers between one and eight that are different. And there's a piece in row I, column J, and there's a piece in row J, column I. So let's look at the picture. We can get the solution that Chad came up with is two pieces is correct. Um, and you can have, and what it means is that they're in sort of, there's the pieces will be symmetric with respect to the, the diagonal that goes from the upper right to the lower, the upper left to the lower right. So you'll have one piece in row two, column one, let's say, and then another piece in row one, column two. So it's symmetric with respect to the diagonal and you can't, and, and, and you don't need any pieces on the diagonal because this is saying there is a piece that has a row different from its column. Very nice chat, very nice. I think we have, I believe we have two left and that ends this section. But we're getting a little sneaky. So this is gonna get sneaky. So these, these last two are really gonna make us think. We're gonna have to ponder about these last two. Hopefully it'll stretch, stretch it, stretch our minds. So here's the statement. P31 and for all I and J, if PIJ with I less than eight and J less than eight, then PI plus one, J plus one. So let me say that one more time. We have P31 and another thing for all I and for all J, if we have PIJ and I less than eight and J less than eight, then PI plus one, J plus one. Again, PIJ here represents there's a piece in row I column J and the universe is the numbers one through eight. What is a board that satisfies this? What is the minimum number of pieces on your board? So, What's a piece we know for sure is on the board? We can't get away from having this on the board. Three, one. Absolutely. So we definitely have a piece in the square three, one. Now, does the next part force us to have more pieces? So if we have a piece in three, one, does the second part of this statement, of this and statement, say that we must have another piece too? So let's see. So for all I and for all J, it says, if you have a piece in the row I column J, and I is less than eight and J is less than eight, you better also have one in row I plus one, column J plus one. So what happens when we plug three one in for I and J? Let's see. So we have piece in row three, column one. And then we plug in three and one for I and J. And, and this statement, which is true for all I and J says, 
let's see. So three, if you have a piece in three, one with three less than eight and one less than eight, then you also have a piece in row four, column two. Hmm. Okay. So does that mean two pieces? Well, hold on a second. Now we have to see if this statement also applies to four, two. So we plug in I equals four and J equals two. It says, if you have a piece in row four, column two, and four is less than eight and two is less than eight, then you also have a piece in row five, column three. And we can apply it again and again until we get to, so let's say we apply it again. So we just had four, two, five, three. Then we have six, four, seven, five, eight, six. And then we hit, we hit the bottom of the board. So if that reasoning is correct, there should be something like six pieces, which I see a bunch of people in chat screaming, which is nice. But I think, I think we got it, right? So we have this piece in three, one, and that piece in three, one, by the second statement, forces there to be one in four, two, and then gives us five, three, and then six, four, and then seven, five, and then eight, six. And we get six pieces. Now, there are boards satisfying the statement that have tons more pieces, but the minimal example only has six. Trying to find the best fit answer. Yeah. So, and you shouldn't stop at seven, five, because seven, I equals seven, J equals five is still less than eight. And that still guarantees that you get eight, six. But good question. I like these questions from chat. Really nice. Last one. Maybe we'll see how this one goes. It's shorter, but maybe it's still a little tricky. Suppose you have for all I and for all J, I greater than J implies PIJ. What is the board with the minimal number of pieces and how many pieces are on it? Again, PIJ means there's a piece in row I column J. So we have to think about what is this statement saying? So what are the, so we're saying for all I and J, if I is greater than J, then there's a piece in row I column J. What are those, what, what, where do those pieces look like on the board? So what are the pieces that have the row bigger than the column? So let's think of, let's think of some squares on the board and then think of whether the row is bigger than the column. So suppose we have a, a, a square on the diagonal. What are those squares? Those are the squares where the row is equal to the column. So those don't count. Okay. Now let's try a, a square like two, one. Two, one has the row bigger than diagonal. The same is true for three, one and four, one and five, one all the way down to eight, one. And then in the second column, what are the squares that have the row bigger than the diagonal? That would be three, two, four, two. When I say three, two, I mean row three, column two, row four, column two, row five. So this condition is saying it, for every square that's below the diagonal, there's a piece there. So we just have to count up how many are there. And counting problems like this come from a field of math called combinatorics, where you have to count things. So it's like, how many squares are there below the diagonal? So is there some way we could do this? Now, people are saying, why don't I try adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7? Something like that could definitely work, and we have to do that arithmetic. There's Sometimes you can use other ways, like symmetry. So we said that none of the squares in the diagonal work. So that removes eight squares. So we started with a total of 64 squares on an eight by eight board. We removed eight, that brought us down to 56 squares. And then of the remaining 56 squares, half are below the diagonal and half are above the diagonal. So 56 divided by two should be 28. And that's another way of computing the same exact quantity, one plus two plus three plus four plus five, six plus seven. So let's see if that's right. Cross fingers. 28 pieces. Oh my. And you can see they're all below the diagonal. So. Nice. This, this gets it. And that is, uh, and that's the end of our review of first order logic. Um, so if, so this is up to you, we could uh, take, we could spend a few minutes talking about infinite things, or we could save that for next time. It's up to you. Let's see what our 
uptime is. We are at one hour, 49 minutes in this discussion so far. You want to just finish this off? I think this is about uh, maybe five, 10 minutes. Let's hack and well, do it, dude. Let's, let's look do at it. infinity. So we, let's look at infinity. So now we're going to take our, we're going to get a glimpse of math, some more advanced math. And I want to see if we can use some of our first order logic that we've learned to think about something that's a little more complicated. But we're going to stay within this like chessboard idea. But I'm going to make the chessboard simpler and harder at the same time. We're going to look at only one row of the board. But I'm going to let there be infinitely many columns. So it's this unending row of, of squares on a chessboard. The columns will be numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and unending. All the positive whole numbers will get a column number. All, the, all of them are legal column numbers. So we have one enormous row. And we'll let P of I be the predicate that represents there is a piece in column I. We don't need a row anymore. There's just one row. So just the infinite row. So. Here comes our question. And these are going to get a little sneaky, so we're going to think about this. But this gets to the heart of the notion of infinity and calculus. Even though we're not going to talk about any numbers, like any, any like functions, we're not going to talk about derivatives or any of this stuff in calculus. But we're going to try to get at the heart of some of the concepts in calculus, just using some of the first order logic that we've learned. So I want to give the English meaning of the following expression. There exists i there such that for all j, j greater than i implies p of j. So this is so these statements about this infinite board are not going to be trivial. So so it's, it's really going to require some thinking to understand what they mean. So you so it's good to think of like what kinds of boards, what kinds of rows and pieces on those rows would satisfy this statement. So, hmm, so one more time, there is an I such that for all J, if J is greater than I, then PJ, what does this mean? And pay close attention to the order of the exists and for all. So let's try to come up with an English meaning for this statement. And just as a reminder, P of J here means there is a piece in column J. And, and, and this is not easy. So just, it's fine chat. If you want to just answer, don't worry about being wrong. The stuff we're doing now is getting harder. This is tricky stuff. So just think aloud. Hmm. Okay, someone's saying, oh, this is giving me the idea of kind of like sequences and convergence. This is like the beginning of the idea of like thinking about sequences. And sequences is like the, one of the core ideas in calculus. Someone's talking about, okay, where, think about where the row is filled. There's pieces, there's infinite columns. Okay, I like what Chad is saying here. So let's see. So we're first saying there exists an I. So there is a position I somewhere on the board. That's the exist I. And then it's saying for all J, bigger than i, there's a piece in j. So what do we think that looks like? It's like there's a position i such that everything to the right of it has a piece in it. So at some point, at some column, after that column, the row, the, the row is full. So hopefully that's what it says in the solution. And hopefully I have a picture there. Yep. That says, so in this picture, you can see like position three, position three and on all pieces. I'm so sorry, position, everything, sorry, position four and on all pieces. So everything to the right of position three is full. So one way of saying it is there is a column such that all columns to the right of it have a piece. Or in other words, if we're moving rightward along this row, eventually, at some point, all squares have pieces because eventually there's going to be some position where everything to the right of it has a piece. So this notion of eventually is key to thinking about infinities and the way calculus is sort of thought about and the core concepts of calculus. 
thinking about things like eventually. Let's try another one. Give the English meaning of the following expression. For all i, there exists a j such that j is greater than i and pj. So this one's a little different. The order is different, and then now there's an and symbol inside. So try to think of what this one means. And again, these are not easy. These, these are getting, these are starting to really get at something deep that took mathematicians hundreds of years to come up with. So we're doing hundreds of years in about five, 10 minutes. Which means if you can answer this question, you're smarter than all of them. You are learning at an incredible pace. <laughs> Someone's saying, however high you count, there's a piece. Yeah, so that's a good answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and so someone's saying, isn't the same as the before? There's a subtle way this is different. And we want to think about that. Um, so let's think about what this means. It's saying for every position, there is a position to the right of that position that has a piece. There's another way of saying this in a very short way. But it's like, but it's, I'm not saying it's tricky, but it's like hard. To, it's like, hard to know that that's what that meaning is. So another way of saying this, and this is interesting to think about, is that this is the same exact thing as saying that there's infinitely many pieces in the row. Let's think about that. Because if there exists another piece every single time, exactly, you're never going to run out. Yes, it's saying for every position, there's going to be a position to the right of you, a, a piece to the right of you. So there's always going to be more. It is not saying the same thing as the first statement. So the first statement we had was that at some point, everything to the right of it has pieces in it that you eventually have are full. It is true that if you are eventually full, then you have infinitely many pieces, but you can have infinitely many pieces and not eventually be full. Like what if they alternated piece, no piece, piece, no piece, piece, no piece, piece, no piece. You can still have infinitely many pieces. So the picture here should represent that. So you can have a situation where you have a piece and then no piece and then piece, piece, no piece, no piece, no piece, piece. And then I can't draw the infinitely many columns, but uh, so assume that there's in, you keep going and there's, there's going to be a no piece and then a piece and then a no piece and a piece. And maybe there's a bunch of pieces in a row. Maybe it's even eventually all pieces, but this is not saying that that has to happen. It's just saying that there's infinitely many. Or as we said, another way of saying it is that every column has a piece to the right of it. And these are the saying the same thing. Okay. I think we have two left and then we are officially done. What is the negation of the following statement? So we're getting tricky here. Here's the statement. I want, and I want its negation. There is an I such that for all J, J greater than I implies P of J. So this is the, the, the same statement from question one. What is its negation? So if we recall what this statement means is there is a position where everything to the right of it is full. So eventually all the squares are full. What is the negation of that statement? So a uh, so um, a simple way of saying it is is it is not true that eventually all the pieces are all the squares are full. So so that's that's a simple way of saying it. Another way is we could just be one of these uh, symbolic robots and just go through it with a not symbol and say the negation of this would be for all i there exists a j where the statement in there is not true, which would mean that. Um, yeah, so then, and the negation of this implication would be that J is greater than I and there's no square in it. So, so you could either, so two ways of saying this, you could either say it is not true that it is eventually all full. You could also, another way of saying that is there are, and this is a, this is a bit, a little bit of a leap, but I'll say it anyway. There are infinitely many empty squares, which is sneaky. But that's what the answer is. And I think hopefully the solution reveals that. 
but these are uh, these are not simple these these require thinking about what's going on and re really thinking about what the logic means and i think it's good to ponder about these because these concepts are core to things in calculus so let's do the final one and then we'll give everyone's brain a rest because it's been a lot of logic the last one question four so i want the negation of the second statement we did which is for all i there exists a j such that j is greater than i and pj in other words as we said for every position there is a position to the right of it that has a piece which we said if you recall is the same thing as saying there's infinitely many pieces so what's the negation of that so what's the negation of there being infinitely many pieces hmm. you're going to run out at some point there are exactly there are finitely many pieces so and hopefully that's the answer. Another way of saying it, if we just go through the symbolic robot and we look at the solution, you'll see that it's there is an i such that for all j, j is greater than i implies not pj. So, or in other words, eventually all the squares are empty. So, and you can think about why that's exactly the same thing as saying that there are finitely many pieces. That saying eventually all the squares are empty is exactly the same concept as there are finitely many pieces. And these are like a bit of a brain twister they're they're hard to think about but they're they're interesting and i think that's it so the next page just says what's next and i think that's a question that we're going to think about but also we'd love input from chat about what topics uh would be found, find interesting um i know i'm going we've had ideas to try to make them connected to games maybe there might be some probability there could be poker or maybe some probability that occurs in some of the video games, neural plays like, wow, we could talk about, one of the topics I've thought about talking about is like explaining what is statistics and giving some simple examples about how statistics works, some of the core ideas in statistics, but uh, we're open to suggestions. We'd love to talk about tons of topics. Math is broad. One of the domains that was really exciting for me in university was in judgments and decision making, the difference between the mathematically correct approach and the intuitive, natural human approach. We have a bunch of heuristics which cause us to take mental shortcuts that lead us to make predictable errors kind of across the board, just how we're wired. So gambler's fallacy is one of those. So I think having a, a pass at a lot of those biases that we carry around and oftentimes aren't aware of, and then how to be rigorous and logical moving through those sure we could do yeah so i think those are great yeah i mean people are notoriously bad at probabilistic intuition and you sort of have to relearn it and then you said i think you said previously that like when you were studying to be good at poker you had to like fix some of these biases and train yourself to spot things and then these come up all the time when people are doing studies um, these notions of selection bias or regression to the mean there's lots of lots of things you have to know to look out for because they can they can definitely ruin both your if you're doing a statistical study your results they can also ruin your intuition about what's going on in a game and make cause you to make inferior decisions or in life in general and learning how to be objective and to properly understand how the probability and the various mathematics underlying these processes works will help you to just make superior decisions. So, but in general, we are open to lots of, uh, lots of topics. Uh, we'll try to present them in a similar way where there's uh, little prerequisites, but hopefully we, by the end of it, we can talk about some interesting things that really have some importance. Um, and as a result of this, I hope if you ever do want to look at a book on logic or think logically about topics or um, want to get into more math or computer science, that this will give you a primer that helps you with all the logical content, both the propositions and the first order. There was a question about whether these slides could be uploaded somewhere. I could just upload them to the math channel in Discord. Does that work Absolutely. for you? Absolutely. Neuro has all the slides. Sweet. Um, I'm, I'm, any other questions, I'm happy to answer, but uh, I hope all of you enjoyed it. Uh, uh, 
hope it was uh, informative. Yeah, I really like the progression from at the very start. It's so simple that you're like, oh man, come on, dude, like everybody knows this. And then by the end, some people, they got uh, raided in here from Ragnarokette and it's like you're at the most confusing part at the, at the very end where all the other knowledge over the course of the lecture is built up. And you're like, why does my brain feel like I just got thrown into a washing machine? <laughs> Yeah, like I, I think I was here before and Brett said no prerequisites and now you're talking about infinite rows and there exists what what just happened where, where I, I made a wrong turn somewhere this raid yeah should have taken a right where it took a left yeah <laughs> nice so these slides are in the math to discord channel and I, I, as we said earlier that this I mean, logic comes up everywhere in in mathematics, in uh, philosophy, and just in in, in law. Obviously, um, it, it's it's like a sort of general thought that the people who study logic and philosophy and math tend to do very well in their LSATs because they're sort of these logic monsters. Mm -hmm. So it comes up in law, yeah, philosophy, mathematics. Um, I mean, all the all the fields that build off of math have strong ties to mathematical logic. So. There were mentions of music theory before. Mm. How connected do you feel you are to that? Yeah, so um, there's, okay, so there's certain aspects of music um, based on, uh, so let's, let me put this in context. So part, part of the answer is not at all. I mean, basically I, to prepare for the next uh, session, I would just become a musician. And then, and then uh, teach on it. So, so I, I don't really have that much music background. That said, I mean, through the math I've studied, I do know um, what a topic which is called harmonic analysis, and that is sort of used to understand and take a signal that you would produce with an instrument or with your voice and decompose it into its frequency components and say, oh, these are these pitches, and understand how to do the signal processing on 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 music. So I, I know how to do that, and I. Um, and I could describe that and I'd try to describe it at a level that is understandable. Um, but I wouldn't be able to give all of the color that a musician would and to explain maybe some of the deeper music theoretic aspects of it. So it's possible that I might not be the perfect person for that, even though I could definitely give you a purely math angle on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done some frequency analysis on uh, musical notes and music music's being played and like, and understanding like what the overtones are and like how the different harmonies combine to produce different notes and why a, a human voice singing a note is different from each different instrument playing the note. And you can, you can see that pictorially by like decomposing these notes using signal processing. And that's the kind of signal processing that is done in like the, uh, the tools that uh, um, audio engineers use. Um, and that's something I can talk about, but, but I think, to do this justice, you probably want someone who is more of a musician. Mm -hmm. Incompleteness theorems. Ah, uh, so incompleteness theorems is, is not the same, but it's it's kind of related uh, to. So if you remember, so people, if, if they haven't, that we we did a podcast before this one where we did a little bit of a intro to why we're doing these podcasts, and we did a a history of probability, and in the history of probability, we came to this guy David Hilbert. Who, who basically in the beginning of the 1900 said like, hey, these are some problems that are really important. And everyone said, this guy knows what he's talking about. This is obviously a joke. I mean, David Hilbert's an amazing mathematician. It wasn't just those problems, but, but he came up with this list of problems which are very famous and everyone was working on them. And I said as a digression that one of those problems was ended up being that a certain type of mathematical problem is unsolvable. It was this thing's called uh, Diophantine equations, solving them. And it's like an impossible task. The actual solution was that this is impossible. And it, that is somehow related to the incompleteness theorem. And you also mentioned this book, which I ha unfortunately haven't read, Gertel Escher Bach, which also talks about similar things. And it talks about man, a little bit of a dire situation about how um, th there's different parts of the inc incompleteness theorem, but it talks about how this aspect of logic, which says you can talk about statements that are true 
and you can talk about statements that are provable. And that doesn't always mean the same thing. So it is, it is the case that if you prove something to be true, it is true. But there could be statements that are true that you can't prove to be true. Just going to have to take my word for it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so th this, is, this, is, this is a deep statement. This is not something I'm going to justify. <laughs> but the fact that that's the case and the fact that there's a difference between the notion of truth and the notion of provability is like at the heart of this. And it's also deeply connected to this um, notion of what it means to be able to solve something on a computer. And the thesis is that what we can solve on computers is what can be solved in general. So the idea that there could be things we can't prove or there could be problems we can't solve, is really like a, if you believe that essentially computers represent what we can do in our brains, like the computers are sort of like a, are mimicking the kinds of thought patterns we're capable of, then these problems are impossible for all of humanity. And they're, they have interesting philosophical ramifications. And so it's a, it's a deep, interesting topic involving um, things that you can't solve with a computer and things that are, you're, are not possible to be done using proofs and logic. And I, I understand why people want to hear about this because it's, it, it's, it touches on like philosophy and like the nature of things, but, but it can get a little technical and deep. A set so, of problems impossible for all of humanity, but easy for a Protoss child. <laughs> <laughs> All you have to do is keep hitting the C button and the carriers just pop out <laughs> and just take out everything. I think the bias is coming through again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're aware of our community base. We've got a bunch yeah, of I mean, nice StarCraft people. Some people saying, what is this? This is confusing. Other people are like, this is amazing. How do a Zerg and a Terran come together and become friends? Talk about Protoss. Yep. Ah, yes, we found some common ground. Well, awesome. So, yeah, but, and so, well, thank you for the suggestions. And maybe I, I really like your idea about the, uh, the kind of not fallacies, but the biases that humans have and like how you can look at certain problems. They seem to have obvious answers, but then you have to be wary of these loopholes that we kind of weren't evolved to solve. So evolution didn't teach us to become probabilists. And as a result, we look at some situations that come up in everyday life and we just have the wrong, the wrong intuition and try to fix those biases is, sounds like a good idea. So devoting some time to that, yeah. And, and yeah, maybe talking about poker or maybe things that occur in WoW or, and there's a lot of other games that people play that involve probability. So we could, we could, we could dive into that, but lots of ideas and we'll think about what to do. What would be the ideal route for someone to contact you if they had a question? So I, I keep an eye on, even though I haven't typed a lot yet, um, I keep an eye on your Discord math chess channel. So you created one. Yep. That's very nice, where I think you put the slides from this chat. So um, I will go there, and if someone wants to ask questions, I will, uh, I will answer them there. Um, I think I will also... I could also, in that Discord channel, put... Uh, a Gmail account I have just for this podcast, which I think I called Brett Mathcast at gmail.com. Cool. I can pin that as well so it stays at let the me top. Just, let me double check. I'm not giving, <laughs> giving away some random. It's, it is exactly right. Brett Mathcast at gmail.com. So if you, if you email Brett Mathcast at gmail.com, I will, I could also try to answer them. Unless I get a deluge of questions, I will try to do my best. So, so at this point, do we have, are we like mandatory have to talk about science and technology now? No, there wasn't a specifically mathematics category. So this is the closest that we could get, I think. Well, I did talk about robots. You did. And we talked about Protoss units That's and scientific. repairing things, which is technology. Yeah, so absolutely. I think we get a pass I, here. We hit all the bases. Yeah, we did it. Yeah, there may be a referee who's like seeing if we're over the line or not, but I think we're solid. <laughs> I think we got it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's very fulfilling for me to be able to share this kind of content with people on Twitch. Thank you very much, Brett, for 
bringing this up as your idea, basically, of getting this knowledge and wisdom out there. My pleasure, and thank you for having me, and thank you for being such a a great host and someone who just <laughs> amazingly intuited the slides before they existed each time. It was really amazing. I'm just used to dealing with incomplete information with scouting and you just anticipate what's in the fog of war, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was uncanny. So yeah, really fun time. I hope everyone liked it. hope it was educational and interesting and maybe we'll, we'll try to continue this trend. Yeah, I like the interaction with the chat as well, where you give some multiple choice and people can guess at that or you give a open-ended question and they can try their best for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know they got I know they got a little tricky at the end. We 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 know that. Yeah. And, uh, but uh yeah, you, you, the chat was great. Awesome. Well, this will be available in podcast form and also on YouTube. YouTube probably the best avenue for these because we do have a good bit of visual through the slides. The slides were posted to the Math Discord channel. You want to contact brett you can do so there he's going to put his email in that area thank you so much chat for your interaction your viewership your interest in this kind of content thank you very much brett for giving us your knowledge and expertise and leading this discussion and we will see you on math lecture number three coming up exciting thank you brett very welcome and thank you for having me boom recording stopped Let's see, upload, and your upload is good, sir. Sweet. Superb. So this will be... Oh, yeah, I got the you're all done message. Oh, wow. Mission accomplished. Yeah, the previous ones, I think we did wave files, which take longer to upload, but these MP3s are done pretty fast, and it seems like yeah, the that internet was, that is... Yeah, that was instant. Yeah. Also, I was worried about the uh, smoothness of the uh, slide transitions, because that was Neuro doing all the slide transitions, and it was spot on. Well done. Oh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm like the try-hard kid in the front of the class who's like paying super close attention, and yeah, if I'm not paying close attention, then the whole lecture gets bogged up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was like, like what are the, uh, the other uses for APM outside of StarCraft? And like, bam, bam. Yeah. those slides well yeah that was amazing i i was i was that was i was stressing about that i was like oh there's gonna be so many slides and he has to always switch and it has to be seamless and then you were just on point i'm not a noob dude come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've had the full range of class experience from my university career some of the classes i'm like not attending or i'm way in the back and kind of distracted but then for certain classes where i would feel really amped up and engaged and I love the material. I'm like in the front full try hard answering questions and trying to be plugged in. That was part of me switching to cognitive science from psychology. The psychology classes I was in, they didn't really uh, connect with me in the same capacity, but I took mm -hmm. the first cog sci course and it was like, I really want to crush this class because I'm having so much fun with it. Yeah, motive, yeah. Finding something you love uh, means, means, means so much. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I had friends that had different tricks with this because, like, I, I had some, fr I had a friend who, who, and we had this on tape because you know that you go to classes and they tape the classes, and she, uh, she would fall asleep in almost every class on tape. We'd see her, <laughs> we, we'd, yeah, we'd see her falling asleep in the class. Like, we're, oh, there she is. Yeah, oh, she's looking at the professor. Oh, no, not anymore. Oh, sleep time. <laughs> right. So, and then her trick was to, uh, to just take careful notes like she was like writing a book and and like she was like the scribe for the class and like the event the the action of trying to take the best notes possible kept her like awake and alert and amazed oh are we getting a, a linear I, I i'm i'm happy to do linear algebra i know one one reason that linear algebra is cool also is i could i could give an introduction to linear algebra and then sort of connect it to how neural networks work so that might be something cool because neural networks firstly your name is neuro yeah um secondly people are like oh neural networks robots taking over i want to understand them linear algebra so, was a pretty fun class yeah so that, that could be a definitely good choice for another topic i have to think about the best way to to put in this format but yeah these are good suggestions chat awesome well i hope you have a fantastic holiday sir 
same to you and i hope you have a great rest of the stream and fun playing starcraft 2 and uh inevitably playing some protos hell yeah well take care bud looking forward to lots of awesome content in 2020 with you sounds great gg uh, good night see you nice